This unit is on the history of Russia. Russian history is one of my favorite topics. I first took a course on the history of Russia when I was in college, and I was completely fascinated, completely caught up with the mystery and how exotic this country is. It has an amazing history. There are incredible stories, sometimes hard to believe. It is a history of great pride and accomplishment of inventors and novelists and artists uh, and fascinating leaders, uh, cruel tyrants, dangerous ideas, incredible violence, and amazing suffering throughout the history of the Russian people. So I hope as we go through this unit on Russian history, you'll find it fascinating as well. Let's talk first a little bit about the geography of Russia. Russia is the largest country in the world. That was true when Russia was part of the Soviet Union, and it's still true today. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union on Christmas Day 1991, Russia still is the largest country in the world. It represents one-eighth of the world's inhabitable land area. It's just a massive size. It covers 11 time zones. It borders 16 other countries. And it's the most populous European nation with 146 million people. Of course, it's a very northern country touching the Arctic Ocean, and it spans so much of the continent of Asia. There is a frequent debate if Russia is more of a European country or an Asian country, but I think really the answer is both. Particularly in Western Russia, it feels very European. It feels like a European country. But as you move to the East, it certainly has a lot of influences from Mongolia and China and Korea, and therefore it can feel very Asian to the East. Uh, of course, most of its population is in the West, centered around large cities such as St. Petersburg and Moscow. And the North, it can be very sparsely settled. But it is a land rich with history, geography, natural resources, rivers, mountains, different types of climate, and also topography. This map represents some of the physical geography of Russia. So what we can see here is that to the west, there's the northern European plain without real high elevations. There are two primary mountain ranges in Russia, which are the Caucasus Mountains, which divide the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and also the Ural Mountains. The Ural Mountains are often considered something of a natural boundary between European Russia in the west and more Asian Russia to the east. To the south, we have the Russian steppe, those famous grasslands, and to the north, we have Siberia. And then, of course, to the far east, you have a group of islands that connect very closely to Japan and, of course, border with Mongolia, China, Korea, and also Japan. There are many natural resources in Russia, including timber, petroleum, natural gas, coal, ores, and other minerals. The Black Sea is a very prominent sea, very important sea in its history. You can see that it borders much of Europe and also what was the Ottoman Empire and will become the country of Turkey. It becomes known as the Black Sea, black indicating uh, foreboding or, or difficult to navigate or unknown. And it's also famous for some of its coarse dark sand along its shores. It becomes a popular resort for the czars. Uh, it was a retreat. A summer retreat for a lot of the czars and also Russian citizens. The peninsula that juts out into the Black Sea is the famous Crimea, which is going to be the center of the Crimean War in the 19th century and has also attracted a lot of attention with Vladimir Putin's takeover of the peninsula, annexation of the peninsula in recent years. Lake Baikal is the largest and deepest freshwater lake in the world immediately to the east of the Black Sea. And we also could note that the Caucasus Mountains, which separates the two lakes, was also part, was used as part of the 2014 Sochi Olympics, 
Vladimir Putin and Russia were very proud to host the Winter Olympics in 2014 of that year. Russia has very famous cities. The most famous probably is its capital, which is Moscow. This is a picture of the Moscow International Business Center, which was built in recent years since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Moscow has become an epicenter in world trade and finance, particularly with the trade of minerals and oil. Moscow has a population of 12 and a half million residents. It is a very fast growing tourist city. There are many millionaires and many billionaires that live in Moscow, particularly connected to the iron ore and petroleum industries. It also has one of the largest and busiest metro systems in the world, it has one of the oldest subways in the world, also one of the deepest subways. It goes far underground. You'll also be amazed how well decorated the subway stations are, including with mosaics featuring prominent events in Russian history. And of course, Moscow is going to feature prominently in a lot of the major historical events in Russia. Another very prominent city in Russia is St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, for a long time, was the capital city of Russia. It was, of course, founded by Peter the Great in the 18th century uh, because the Tsar wanted to have a city on a warm water port to the north. And so St. Petersburg is located on the Neva River and is famous for its bridges, also the White Nights, in which there's very little darkness, particularly in the month of June. St. Petersburg is going to be renamed by the Soviets when they create the Soviet Union and take control of the country. It will be renamed after Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the Russian Revolution, and be called Leningrad. It will suffer tremendously with almost a two-and-a-half-year siege by the Nazis during World War II. And then after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, it will have its original name restored to St. Petersburg, once again named after Peter the Great. There are over 5 million inhabitants in this of Russia's second largest city. Another prominent city we could also mention is Smolensk. Smolensk is one of Russia's oldest cities, and it has been the scene of much suffering in Russian history, particularly because it more or less lies on the invasion route from the West. So the kingdom of Poland and Lithuania in the 16th century, and Napoleon in the 19th century, and the Nazis in the 20th century, often come through this route, and Smolensk lies in their path. And so as a result, Smolensk has been destroyed and rebuilt numerous times throughout its history. Two famous geographical features of Russia are the Russian steppe and Siberia. By the Russian steppe, we mean this semi-arid, which means semi-dry region, with abundant grasslands right across the middle part of Russia. It is a large agricultural area. It reminds us a lot of the American Midwest, particularly states like Wyoming. And it is going to feature prominently with the very famous Cossack warriors in Russian history. Siberia is, of course, this large area to the north, famous for its permafrost. By permafrost, we mean an area that is permanently frozen year-round. Siberia accounts for 77% of Russia's land area, a vast majority of the country. It is home to 33 million people, but that only represents 23% of Russia's population. So what we're looking at here is only three inhabitants per square mile. It is therefore one of the most sparsely populated regions in the world. Now the average temperature in January is about 13 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. It is not uncommon for Russian children to still attend school when the temperatures are 20, temperatures are 20 and 30 below. Recently, a couple of years ago, when temperatures reached 60 below zero, they felt compelled to cancel school. One of the most famous features and industrial accomplishments in Russian history is the Trans-Siberian Railway. This is one of the longest rail lines in history. 
it connects Moscow to Vladivostok at a distance of 5,772 miles. So Moscow, of course, being far to the west, and Vladivostok being on the east coast, on the Pacific side of Russia, with a distance of 5,772 miles. The railway was commissioned by Tsar Alexander III, who was the second to last of the Tsars, and was built between 1891 and 1916. It requires eight days of travel from Moscow to Vladivostok. 30% of Russian exports travel on this line. So it's a very key line, not only for tourism, but particularly for the ore deposits and petroleum and natural gas of Siberia in eastern Russia, making it all the way to Moscow. Let me show you a short video that give you, gives you some of the highlights of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. A journey through breathtaking landscapes. The world's longest railway line, a legend in the truest sense of the word. But for most people, a trip on the Trans-Siberian Railway means something far more. The fulfillment of a lifelong dream. The most popular Trans-Siberian tourist route runs from Moscow through the heart of Russia and Mongolia to Beijing. Moscow, the cultural and political center point of Russia. A visit to the Kremlin is just one of many high points of a tour through the Russian capital. Departure from the Russian capital. An 8,000 kilometer journey on the Tsarengol train lies before us. More than 60 onboard personnel will accompany us, including technicians, chefs, travel guides, and even a doctor. The Bolshoi class offers the most comfortable travel experience with modern amenities, including private bathrooms. As the tables are being prepared in the restaurant, Passengers explore the exclusive transportation that will be their home for the next few days. Some cars are decorated in a style that evokes memories of the Soviet past. In those days, only the ruling elite traveled in such style. Every class offers a level of comfort and coziness that adds a special flair to this unique and magical trip. In addition to the idyllic countryside, travelers can take part in onboard lectures, split up into small groups according to their language. The Russian travel guides seem to have a special passion for the national drink, vodka. But of course, words are not enough to convey the true pleasures of this intoxicating pastime. The vodka flows and the festivities heat up. Kazan, the capital of Tatarstan. Travelers have plenty of time to explore the city. Kazan's Kremlin is an architectural gem and has been named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The newly constructed mosque is a special source of pride for the people of Tatarstan.
Just nearby, visitors will find beautiful Russian Orthodox churches. They are just some of the impressive churches that the travelers will find on their trip through Russia. Shortly before lunch, the onboard kitchen is a hub of activity. The freshest ingredients and a wide variety of gourmet meals make this trip a culinary treat. Of course, Russian specialities make up a large part of the menu. Some 30 onboard personnel operate the train's dining cars, catering to the guests' every wish. Following our visit to Novosibirsk, we arrive in Irkutsk, the provincial capital of Siberia. It's the sixth day of our trip. The Tsarangod's guests spend the night in a hotel on the banks of the mighty Angara River. On the next day, there will be a full program of fascinating sightseeing. One hour outside Irkutsk, an idyllic Siberian village. Trans-Siberian travelers form small groups to visit local families. These Spanish travelers gain up close and personal contact with this remote land and its inhabitants. The guests are treated to a generous portion of local color, cuisine and hospitality. It's an authentic taste of daily life in Russia, a unique experience for our European guests. Lake Baikal, Siberia's holy sea. Guests of the Tsarangold capture some of this magic with a boat ride on Lake Baikal. One of the most beautiful stretches is about to begin, the ride along the magnificent Lake Baikal. This stretch of railway has been off limits to normal train services for years, but the Tsarangold Express has special permission to pass through this captivating region. It's an unforgettable experience for the Tsarangold's guests experiencing Lake Baikal in a unique way. The Tsarangold train crosses into Mongolia. It's a raw and awe-inspiring landscape of rolling hills, yurts and herds of animals. Mongols have a long tradition as master horsemen. This Nadam festival is a ritual competition, pitting the very best riders against one another. Passengers on the Trans-Siberian Railway have front row seats for this fascinating sporting spectacular. Mongols mount their first ponies almost as soon as they can walk. An authentic experience for the travelers and a perfect ending for our excursion through the Terelj National Park. A spectacular sunset as the travelers bid farewell to Mongolia. Just one more night separates them from their final destination, 
the Chinese capital, Beijing. Beijing is one of the world's most dynamic cities, a melting pot of contrasts, pitting unbridled capitalism against a communist regime. 3,000 years of Chinese culture paired with the fast-paced lifestyle of a global economic powerhouse. Our guests have traveled nearly 8,000 kilometers. The dream of a lifetime fulfilled. A journey on the Trans-Siberian Railway. The video gives you an idea of just how many cultures and various geographies and climates that the Trans-Siberian Railroad crosses with almost 6,000 miles to its total length. We can move on now and talk a little bit about Russian culture and art. Famous uh, from Russia are the Pisanki eggs. The Pisanki eggs are actually a Polish creation that emerges first in Poland, but it has widespread influence in Russia. The Pisanki eggs are hard-boiled and then hand-painted by craftsmen with a lot of different decorative designs and colors. And this is probably the origin of where we get our idea of the Easter egg. These are very popular with tourists in each region and sometimes each city in Russia will have its own unique design for its Pisanki eggs. The other famous artistic creation from Russia are the Matryoshka dolls, sometimes called nesting dolls. You might have seen these before in which you have hand handcrafted, hand carved, and hand painted dolls, which the outside doll is rather large, and then as you unscrew the top of the doll and open it, there's one a little smaller inside, and then if you unscrew the head on that one, there's a smaller one inside, and then as you continue to go along, there's a smaller and smaller doll inside. The first Russian, Russian nesting doll was set, was probably made in 1890 by a woodcarver. The largest set of Matryoshka dolls in the world was a 51-piece set, hand-painted and completed, in 2003. There were 51 dolls altogether. The tallest doll, which contained the other 50 dolls, in the set measured 21 inches. And the smallest doll, which was the one most in the interior, the last one to be found, was... 0.12 inches. Arranged side by side, the doll spanned 11 feet 2 and a quarter inches. One of the most famous dishes and popular dishes in Russia is borscht. The best way to understand borscht is that it is beet soup. Beets, the root crop that grows in the ground. Uh, Russians love to have borscht with a lot of meals. Frequently, they will add pork or beef to their borscht soup or various vegetables. It can be served hot or cold. Uh, it is served often with bread and potatoes. I remember traveling through Russia that frequently almost every meal started with a bowl of borscht. Let's move on now and talk a little bit about some of the early history of Russia. We can probably identify the first settlers of what will become Russia as the Slavs. The Slavs are some of these Indo-European peoples that emerge out of the Caucasus Mountains and move north. They set up wood huts and small forts along the Don and Dnieper and Volga rivers across Russia. These are mostly local economies, pretty self-sufficient depending on fishing and hunting and gathering uh, and very small-scale agriculture. You can see that there were various Slavic tribes that settle around what we would call the western part of Russia today into Eastern Europe, uh, and particularly uh, the western part of Russia. So the Slavs definitely were one of the earliest tribes in the history of Russia, and frequently all of Russian people today are often designated as Slavic, whether or not uh, they ethnically in, indeed are Slavic. Uh, so these 
these groups of Slavs, which were important tribes in the area, set up two important cities that we can talk about in the early history, particularly the medieval history of Russia. One is Novgorod, and the other is Kiev. So we're going to talk mostly about Kiev first, and then move on to Russia, uh, and move on to Novgorod. So the primary language in much of Russia, uh, Russia is, not surprisingly, Russian. But there are various dialects and many other languages and local dialects across the country include Belarusian, Ukrainian, and some other extractions of Russia. Here's a general map of the cultures in European Russia uh, when, with the formation of these Slavic settlements. Now, these Slavic settlements are very small along key rivers in Russia, but a key event occurs when the Varangians, who were probably Vikings, descend from what we would call Scandinavia, come down the rivers, and often start trading with the Slavic settlements. They would uh, trade things such as agricultural products, fish, uh, wax, and some local crops as well. The Varangians, or these Vikings, were essentially traders, but they were also pirates. And so as they venture along these waterways, more and more they come into conflict with the Slavic tribes and eventually subdue them. And then the line between Slavs and Vikings is essentially blurred, and this is more or less where we get the Russian people. And so a key important city in the early history of Russia, which is really a combination of Vikings and Slavs, is Kiev and Russia. So we can date the kingdom of Kiev roughly from 1882 to 1240. One of the earliest kings of this area was known as Rurik. He was probably a Viking, and that is also a good chance where we get our word Russia uh, from this king. One of the earliest Viking leaders of Kiev and Russia was Oleg of Novgorod. He not only is instrumental in helping the found of Kiev, but he also founds a very important city to the north, which is Novgorod. Uh, he moves on to conquer all the areas of Kiev and Russia, and he is one of the first to unite all these varied cultures that are in early Russia. So there are Vikings, there are Slavs, and there are also Greek or Byzantine uh, Christians that are coming up from the south. Uh, Oleg of Novgorod is such a powerful king that he actually launches an attack, an invasion against Constantinople in the south, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium. And here's a picture of him nailing his shield to the gate of the city, indicating uh, his success in battle against the Byzantines. Another important leader in the early history of Kiev and Russia is Sviatoslav the Brave. He was one of the first to be known as the Grand Prince of Kiev. Now notice we haven't been talking about czars yet. The czars of Russia will come later, including that term, that title, or that designation. Svatoslav the Brave was very important for expanding the kingdom of Kiev, particularly to the east and the south. So this map indicates how much further Svatoslav was able to expand the territories of Kiev particularly to the east. We see Novgorod in the north here, and then Kiev. So through the efforts of Oleg of Novgorod, Svatoslav the Brave, and then also his son, Vladimir the Great, these two key cities of Novgorod and Kiev slowly start to merge into one Russian kingdom. Vladimir the Great is, without question, one of the most significant leaders in the early history of Russia. His brother was a rather violent fellow and had killed one of their other brothers in an attempt to claim the throne of all of Kiev and Russia. So Vladimir felt compelled to flee for his life and go to Sweden. While in Sweden, he marshaled some forces and succeeded in invading Novgorod and subduing it defeating his brother and therefore taking control of not only Novgorod before continuing on to Kiev and incorporating both into his kingdom. Now Vladimir, like a lot of early Russian leaders and 
Slavs and Vikings was a pagan. He would worship the gods of the sea and of the sun and of the weather, mythological Scandinavian gods. Uh, he would often build them shrines and temples. He was uh, a rather promiscuous fellow, taking 800 concubines and also having numerous wives. But his mother was a Greek Christian, an Orthodox Christian, the religion of Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire, and prayed frequently for her son. And so gradually, her son takes a greater interest in religion. And so he decides that he will convert from paganism to one of the prominent world religions, but he's not sure which one. And so therefore, he interviews representatives from some of the main religions in Asia and in Europe. He interviews a, a adherent to Judaism, also a Muslim, to tell him about Islam. He also receives an envoy from the West, from uh, from Rome, to tell him about Roman Catholic Christianity. And he also speaks with a member of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Vladimir decides that he's not interested in Judaism because he believes the Jews can't possibly have the true religion because they had lost their own significant city of Jerusalem in 70 AD and had been banished around Europe. So therefore, Judaism must not be true. He was also not interested in Islam because the Muslim representative told him that Muslims do not eat pork and they do not drink alcohol. That wasn't going to fly with a Russian leader or the Russian people. So he rejects Islam. He also is not particularly enamored with Roman Catholic Christianity. But he is rather impressed by the argument of the envoy of the Eastern Orthodox Church. What Vladimir is particularly interested in is the iconography, the beautiful icons that decorate Orthodox churches, pictures of saints and of Christ and of miracles and so forth. And he believed they had the most beautiful churches. So as a result, here's a painting of the papal envoy representing the Roman Catholic Church, looking annoyed and, um, and uh, distressed that Vladimir is not interested in Roman Catholicism, but clearly he is interested in listening to the Orthodox priest that explains Orthodox Christianity to him. So as a result, being impressed by the beauty of the churches and what seems to make sense to him, he converts to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. He is baptized and also requires all the citizens of Kiev and Russia to be baptized as well. This is one of the forced baptisms in world history. So as a result, Vladimir converts to Orthodox Christianity. He tried to live out the teachings of the Bible, particularly through acts of charity. He would hand out food and drink to those who are less fortunate, the poor. He made an effort uh, to go out to the people who could not reach him. And a lot of people were impressed that they could see the prince, the great leader of Kiev and Russia. And his work was based on the impulse to help one's neighbors by sharing the burden of carrying the cross. So, as a result, we can date the beginning of Orthodox Christianity in Russia with the baptism of Vladimir and then the bapti forced baptism of all the citizens of Kiev and Russia. So let's talk a little bit about the Russian Orthodox Church. So by Orthodox Christianity, we mean that strain of Christianity that broke with the mainline Christianity that developed during the unified Roman Empire, whereas Roman Catholic Christianity emerges in the West with the Bishop of Rome, who becomes the Pope, as the central figure and belief in the worship and veneration of the Virgin Mary and all the rites of the Catholic Church established in the West, the Russian Orthodox Church breaks from the Eastern Orthodox Church breaks from Rome in 1053 in an event known as the Great Schism. So as a result, much of Eastern Europe and the Eastern Roman Empire, what becomes known as Byzantium, and then uh, Greece and then eventually Russia, with the baptism of Vladimir, becomes the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church. So it's famous for its cathedrals in Russia. There's a long history of Orthodox Christianity 
in Russian history. This is the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. This is uh, a church demonstrating the famous onion domes in the on for the Orthodox Church in Russia. There's been a lot of speculation about what is the purpose of these onion domes. For a long time, a lot of people thought that maybe the onion domes were uh, originated in Russia because with the heavy snowfall, maybe the, the design of the onion domes would cause the snow to slide off the top of the churches. That's probably speculation. A better explanation probably is that it was just beautiful. And so the Russian Orthodox Church and the design, the architects of their churches decide to incorporate, incorporate them frequently. Here's um, another example of some, some of the onion domes. Uh, as many as 25 onion domes on this church. And then the very famous Ivan the Great Bell Tower in the Moscow Kremlin, built in the 16th century. This is an Orthodox church right in the walls of the very famous Kremlin in, or fortress in Moscow itself. Popular symbol for Orthodox Christianity is the three-barred cross. Whereas Western Christianity, usually you'll only see one bar, one horizontal bar on the cross, the Orthodox Church, including the Russian Orthodox Church, has three bars. What do these bars indicate? The largest bar, the one that is horizontal and level, in the middle, represents the crucified Christ. The bar on top, which is also horizontal and also level, represents the thief on the cross who was crucified with Jesus, but who repented. And Jesus assured him that on the same day he would be with him in paradise. And then the bar on the bottom that is slightly crooked at an angle, diagonal, represents the thief that was also crucified with Jesus, but who did not repent of his sins and believe in Christ. Orthodox churches, including the Russian Orthodox Church, are famous for its icons. Icons are artistic depictions of Jesus, uh, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his miracles, or of the disciples, or famous events in church history, saints, perhaps also Russian leaders. Here's an icon of the crucifixion that can be found in Novgorod, in uh, roughly about 1360 AD. This is the Holy Trinity representing the hospitality of Abraham when he greeted uh, visitors who turned out to be angels. And this is uh, the Virgin Mary with the child as well. The head of the Orthodox Church is the patriarch. A patriarch is usually housed in somewhere in Turkey, in Constantinople, Adherents of Orthodox Christianity do not believe that the patriarch has special powers or has a higher role than normal adherents to Orthodox Christianity, um, like the Pope does in Roman Catholic Christianity. Rather, they believe he is simply a brother in the faith and a leader of the church. So there is a patriarch or a leader over the entire Orthodox Church, and there's also a patriarch uh, who heads over the Russian Orthodox Church. So this is Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. He is the current patriarch of Moscow and all of Russia, uh, as he has been since 2009. So, needless to say, with the introduction of Orthodox Christianity and the adoption of the Russian Orthodox Church, Vladimir the Great plays a very pivotal role in the history of Russia. So there is a long strain of Christianity in Russian history which will be attempted to be denied and destroyed and wiped out during the years of Joseph Stalin and the formation of the Soviet Union. Russia is officially an atheistic state during the years of the Soviet Union, but nevertheless the church survives and it still plays a prominent role in Russian society still today in, the, in contemporary Russia. So moving on in our discussion of medieval Russia and talking particularly about Kiev and Novgorod, we can talk about the son of Vladimir the Great. This is Yaroslav the Wise. He was known as the Grand Prince of Novgorod and Kiev, one of the first to successfully unite these two cities, these two kingdoms. 
He's known for codifying or writing down, organizing the laws of Kiev in Russia. And we can see under the reign of Yaroslav that Kiev in Russia reaches its cultural and artistic pinnacle. A lot of famous iconography that emerges in Kiev in Russia during the reign of Yaroslav, including uh, famous mosaics depicting saints and leaders as well. So Kiev in Russia certainly is a very important kingdom uh, more towards the east, and Novgorod is this important city a little bit more to the west. What is fascinating about Novgorod to the north and to the west is that at certain points in its history, it's actually a republic. So by a republic, we mean that the public, the people, play a role in government, actually have a voice in government. So we can date the Novgorod Republic roughly from 1136 to 1478 AD. This is the extent of its territory and influence. You can see that it incorporates uh, much of Kiev in Russia and uh, also held vast tracts of land to the east. In Novgorod, we can see one of the most important architectural features in Russian history, which is the Kremlin. By a Kremlin, we mean a fortress. And so it is, of course, very important during the medieval period to have high walls and watchtowers and uh, archers stations where you could fire arrows at an attacking enemy. And so this is a picture of the Kremlin that surrounds Novgorod. You can travel throughout Russia and see smaller Kremlins or the remnants of a Kremlin's walls outside of a city, including Smolensk. Um, but the most famous Kremlin would be, of course, in, be in Moscow. It is the largest, and it is also the seat of the Russian government. So the Russian president and his cabinet uh, would have his offices and often live inside the walls of the Kremlin uh, which is the largest in all of Russia. So in Novgorod, despite having these very authoritarian, authoritarian leaders throughout Russian history, we actually see in the marketplace people holding public assemblies and voting and discussing things. Uh, there is uh, assemblages of people coming to, together to discuss what is best for their city of Novgorod. Here is one of the old churches in Novgorod. Of course, uh, with the abundance of timber in Russia, we see the construction of a lot of dwellings and churches made out of wood. And this is the Cathedral of St. Sophia, which is the main cathedral of the Novgorod Republic. The Novgorod Republic, of course, has the same problem that Smolensk has in much of its history. That is, to the west in Russia, and that it lay, lies along one of these primary invasion routes towards the east. And so invaders from the west, from Europe, who are looking to subdue Russia would often come through its gates. So it was important that it, the walls of its Kremlin were very high, and throughout its history, Novgorod is besieged by the Kingdom of Lithuania, the Kingdom of Sweden, later on by the Muscovites, who will form the city of Moscow, and also the Golden Horde, by which we mean the Mongol invaders. The last important leader we ought to mention in medieval Russia is Alexander Nevsky. Alexander Nevsky, according to many in Russia, is Russia's greatest national hero. He was the Grand Prince of Kiev for only a brief period of time, 1246 to 1263, but he's known as one of the most successful medieval princes as just a very young man, as a young prince, he successfully beat back a very large combined German and Swedish invasion and therefore preserved the kingdom of Kiev. He makes a very smart move in the sense that he is willing to pay tribute to the Golden Horde, to the Mongol invaders, and thus prevent the destruction of his kingdom. In 1547, he's going to be canonized as a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church, and one of the highest military honors in the uh, Russian military is to receive the Order of Alexander Nevsky. It means that you are a national hero for the defense of Russia. So the greatest threat for the kingdom of Novgorod and the kingdom of Kiev, and when they are actually united, is not invaders, 
from the West, from Europe, but rather invaders from the East. And this is the Golden Horde. These are the Mongol invaders, all the way from Mongolia. They're called the Golden Horde because gold seems to be the color of royalty among the Mongols, and horde meant camp in Mon Mongolian language. So the Golden Horde, or the royal camp of invaders, were these very large armies that came from Mongolia in the east all across the steppe of Russia, living on the land, destroying everything in sight, uh, enacting a rule of terror, destroying Slavic and Kievan settlements uh, as they march west. The very famous leader of the Golden Horde was Genghis Khan who lived from 1162 to 1227. He was a great strategist. He recruited large armies. He follows a lot of Chinese military protocols and created very large armies and divisions and battalions. Uh, he was known for quickly attacking his enemy and then feigning a retreat as if they were being defeated. And then when uh, his enemies were stretched out, he would quickly counterattack and overwhelm his enemies. Genghis Khan would go up to the gates of a city, and if the city did not surrender, once the city was defeated, he would massacre everyone inside. Needless to say, word of the Mongol invaders and their terror that they brought with them traveled all across Russia and Eastern Europe, and so it quickly led to their subjugation. Here is... Uh, a depiction of Genghis Khan uh, proclaiming himself the Khan of all the Mongols and then all the way into Russia. He's actually very successful in defeating Kiev and Russia. This is uh, another map of the Mongol Empire, uh, which again extended all the way to the west. And so after subjugating China and what we call Mongolia today, in eastern Russia, the armies move all the way to the west in the 13th century, subjugating and almost completely destroying Kiev and Russia. The massacres are immense in Kiev. Uh, in the Primary Chronicle, which is an old document written by Russian monks and tells us stories and legends of early Russia, the mention is made there of the Mongol invasion and uh, there wasn't a eye left to cry because of the massacres and the immense slaughter. For years to come, travelers would go to Kiev and see this, the skeletons and the skulls of the victims of the Mongols and Genghis Khan as he marched west. This is a map from the 13th century indicating the vast territory that the Golden Horde controlled, even to the city of Moscow in the north, and all the way down to Baghdad in the south, and much of what we would call China, and of course Mongolia, down even into India, uh, and a bit of Southeast Asia as well. The Golden Horde, the, Moscow, the Mongols, wanted two things from, the, from Kiev and Russia and Novgorod. One was obedience, total submission, and the other was taxes. So a way to preserve your head and not be massacred by the Mongols would be willing if you were, it would be if you would be willing to pay tribute or large taxes to the Mongol armies. That was enough. Uh, it was essentially a security fee uh, to prevent them from destroying you. So some of the earliest princes of Moscow are smart enough to pay this tribute, which prevents large-scale destruction of their city. And uh, that is a key event in the development of Russia, whereas Kiev and Russia is destroyed and Novgorod becomes reduced. Muscovite Russia, the settlements that emerge around what will become the city of Moscow, are wise enough to pay large tribute to the Mongols for a long period of time. So this is a dark time in the 13th and 14th century, 200 years of domination by the Mongols, first under Genghis Khan and then by his successors, the Khans of the Mongols, which we call the Tartar yoke. Tartar is yet another word for the Mongols, in which there is total oppression and submission to the Tartars, to the Mongols, and heavy uh, burden of taxation that is paid to their leaders. 
In the next lecture, we'll start to talk more about Muscovite Russia, the settlements that emerge around Moscow, how they throw off the Tartar yoke, and how they become the center of late medieval Russian civilization.